Okay, we're going to talk about the life cycle of stars, and here it is. So, where do stars come from? It all starts in a nebula. A nebula is a huge cloud of dust and gas in space, okay? And inside that nebula, there'll be certain regions that start to coalesce under their own gravity, these molecular clouds, okay? Now, a molecular cloud is mostly hydrogen, the bit of dust. And, it's, and like I say, it starts to collapse under its own gravity. And as it does so, it heats up. And as it heats up and gets denser, it, it forms a protostar, meaning something just before a star. And eventually it gets so hot and so dense as it collapses, something called fusion kicks off. And that's when the star switches on. This is nuclear fusion. It's the power source of a star, such as our sun. Nuclear fusion is when all the hydrogen in the molecular cloud, the hydrogen atoms fuse together to form helium atoms. Hydrogen is the first element in the periodic table. Helium is the second, okay? So it's how helium is made from hydrogen. And that's the energy source of a star. And when it's in this phase of its life, when it's just sitting there, happily fusing hydrogen into helium, this is called the main sequence of the star's life. So an average star, like our sun, an average sized star, well, our sun ha will spend about 10 billion years in its main sequence. And the sun is about 4.6 billion years old now, so it's about middle-aged, which is pretty amazing, really. Okay, so we'll talk about this route in a minute, but for average-sized molecular clouds and stars, they go down this route. Okay, so once the fusion has started, an average-sized star like our sun will sit there for about 10 billion years, happily fusing hydrogen to form helium, and this releases energy. It's why the sun glows and provides planet Earth with lots of lovely energy to keep us all alive. But eventually, that hydrogen runs out. And at that point, the helium starts to fuse together to form carbon and oxygen. And this is when the star expands into a so-called red giant. Now, when our sun does this in about 4 billion years, its radius will increase to the point where the outer limit of the star will be about where planet Earth is. So, somewhere between Venus and Earth, they think. So, it's possible that as the sun expands in four billion years to become a red giant, it will actually engulf planet Earth, okay? Now, at this point, the red giant loses some of its mass, okay? It drifts off into space. And that's called a so-called, that's called a, planet, a planetary nebula, okay? Not to be confused with a nebula. And these are very beautiful things. Go on the internet and have a look at some pictures. They're, they're very, very beautiful. And then the red giant, having lost some of its mass in the nebula, in the planetary nebula, will collapse down into a white dwarf. Now there's no fusion going on anymore at this point, okay? It's burned all its fuel and a white dwarf is a typical size, well our sun, will be about the size of planet Earth. It loses about half its mass in the planetary nebula, so we're talking about something, well, our sun will be half its current mass, which is still pretty huge compa compared to planet Earth, but something the size of planet Earth. So it's very dense. It's also still very hot. It's, it's not burning hydrogen or doing any fusion anymore, but it's still very hot. So that's a white dwarf. And it sits there and slowly cools down. And as it gets cooler and dimmer, it turns into a black dwarf, which is just 
a ball of dense, cool matter sitting there in space. So that's what's going to happen to our sun. Now, what if you're much bigger than our sun? If you're around eight times more massive than our sun, eight times or more, you go down this path, okay? Same as before, you will form a star, only it's a massive star, it's much bigger than our sun. Why have I drawn it blue rather than sort of the orangey colour of our sun? Well, the bigger the stars, the hotter they, they are and the brighter. So the really big ones can be this sort of blue-white colour, although the colours do vary. Okay, so same thing as before. This is the main sequence. It's burning hydrogen and forming helium in nuclear fusion. Now, even though it's much bigger and has at least eight times as much material as our sun, it spends, it, it burns through it much faster because it's, it's hotter and more dense in the center. So it, it might seem counterintuitive, but these massive stars have much shorter lifespans than our sun. So I, like I said, our sun will spend about 10 billion years in its main sequence, and it's halfway through that at the moment. Um, a star much bigger than our sun, a really big one, it could spend only as little as a million years in its main sequence, but a typical time might be about 20 million years, okay? So much less it gets than our sun. It gets through its material much faster. So, same thing as before. When it's used all its hydrogen, when it's fused all the hydrogen into helium, it will start to expand as the helium starts to fuse to form heavier elements. Now, with the more massive stars, it can continue to fuse. It's so hot and dense in the core, it can continue to fuse its elements into heavier and heavier ones. So the carbon and the oxygen and the helium that's there, it keeps on fusing together to form heavier and heavier elements. Now, and, and just like before, this, at this point, it starts to expand into a red, in this case, supergiant. Now, inside these supergiants, fusion cannot create any elements heavier than iron, okay? And iron is the 26th element in the periodic table. So, you end up with an iron core in the red supergiant. And eventually that core collapses and at this point you get this huge explosion and that is a supernova okay and in the supernova the energy that's provided allows fusion to form heavier elements beyond iron now we are made mostly of elements below iron in the periodic table, mostly carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. But some elements inside our bodies that are essential to life are heavier than iron, such as zinc and selenium. And we do have a little bit of those inside us, which means we are partially made of material that came from a supernova. Pretty cool, right? And the rest of us is made from material inside that was formed inside stars. So we are quite literally made of stars and supernova. Okay, now what's left over after the supernova explosion? Right, if the star is be between about 8 and 20 times the mass of the sun, it'll go down this route here and form a neutron star. That's what's left after the supernova explosion. A neutron star is 
made mostly of neutrons and it's incredibly dense. A typically sized neutron star will be about 20 kilometers across. And we're talking about something that has the mass at least, or started off, it, it does lose some mass in the supernova, okay? But it started off with mass at least eight times that of our sun. So there's a huge amount of matter in something only 20 kilometers across. It's incredibly dense and made most, mostly of neutrons. Now, what, what about here? If you're about 20 times, you started off here, 20 times more massive than our sun, after the supernova explosion, you will form a black hole. And that's when there's so much material left after the supernova explosion, it collapses under its own gravity to form a singularity. And a singularity at the center of a black hole is when all of that matter has been condensed and crushed to an infinitely dense point, and that's called a singularity. And it has an extremely strong gravitational field. With black holes, there's this thing called an event horizon, which is a certain distance from the black hole. And if you go inside that event horizon, you can never escape. Even light, once it's inside the event horizon of the black hole, can't escape, okay? The most powerful spaceship you can build, if it approached this black hole, okay, and then just went inside, just inside the event horizon, turned around and put its engines on full blast and tried to escape, away from the black hole, it's not gonna happen. There's nothing you can do to escape from a black hole once you're inside the event horizon. Okay, well, that's pretty much it. Let's just uh, add a few details here and there. If you want to see a red supergiant, you don't even need a telescope. Just look up at the night sky. And for example, an example of a red supergiant would be Betelgeuse, which is in the Orion constellation. You can see it glowing there, red, very clear. Betelgeuse is about, about, they think, 12 or 15 times more massive than the sun. So it's not, going, it's not big enough to be a black hole one day, but it will end up as a neutron star. And it's very, very big. If you placed Betelgeuse at the center of our solar system, its radius would reach about Jupiter, okay? So it's very, very large. Now, also, I just want to talk about, just briefly, you can also get things called red dwarfs and brown dwarfs. When the molecular cloud forms, if it has much less material than our sun, it can form a red dwarf, okay? Now, a red dwarf is a star powered by fusion, like our sun, but it's much smaller, so it doesn't glow as brightly. And red dwarfs have a huge lifespan they think about 100 billion years. So all the red dwarfs that exist in the universe, the universe is only about 13.7 billion years old. So all the red dwarfs in the universe, they're, they're just, they're sitting there. They have nothing, they haven't gone on beyond the stage of being a red dwarf because their lifespan is 100 billion years about and the universe is only 13.7 billion years old. Okay, so you can get red dwarfs Also, you can get brown dwarfs, and a brown dwarf, okay, is when brown dwarf, okay, if there's less than about 10% of the mass of the sun, then the molecular cloud and protostar will form a brown dwarf. These are not quite big enough for hydrogen fusion to take place. You can get 
a bit of deuterium fusion apparently in them but they don't have the same main power source that stars bigger than about 10% the size of our sun have. Red dwarfs, our sun, average stars and massive ones. Okay, so there it is. That is the life cycle of stars.